Welcome to the first of two short screencasts uh, looking at the types of studies that you need to learn for the research method section of the SY2 exam. Now the past exam question that you can see on the screen at the moment shows you the layout of the method section of the SY2 exam. So you'll be given a short bit of text to read and that's normally um, a short summary of a piece of sociological research and then you get two questions and remember it's a minute a mark so you need to spend 10 minutes on the first question and 20 minutes on the second question. Now if we look at the second question it says with reference to the item and sociological studies. So in the 20 mark question you always have to illustrate your answer with reference to real pieces of sociological research. So what I'm going to do in this screencast and the next one is give you a range of studies that you can use to illustrate your knowledge of the main sociological methods and therefore answer uh, this 20 mark question fully. So let's begin by looking at some studies that you could use if you were to get an exam question on the use of experiments. And a very famous example of a laboratory experiment which we've mentioned in relation to our media sociology work is Bandura's experiment. So in this experiment Bandura showed uh, children a video of somebody beating up a bobo doll as you can see uh, in these images uh, and then he put uh, children uh, into a room uh, with a bobo doll to see if they would imitate the behaviour that they'd previously seen on the video. So you can see this in the images that you've got on the screen at the moment. So this was the video that the children were shown and then they were taken to this room and uh, given a bobo doll to play with after. And the findings of this experiment uh, suggested that children tended to model the behaviour that they had witnessed in the video. And this has often been taken to imply that children may imitate uh, aggressive behaviours uh, witnessed in the mass media. However, Bandura's experiments have been heavily criticised uh, by David Gauntlet. Uh, for example, David Gauntlet argues that it's difficult to generalise from aggression uh, towards a bobo doll uh, to person-on-person -person violence. So the argument here is this type of experiment uh, might lack ecological validity. It's a very artificial uh, situation. Secondly, Gauntlet argues that it may be possible that the children were motivated simply to please the experimenter uh, rather than to be aggressive. In other words, the children may have viewed the videos as instructions uh, rather than incentives uh, to feel more aggressive. Because of their artificiality, laboratory experiments are rarely used in sociological research. And if sociologists decide to use an experimental approach, they're more likely to use what we call a field experiment, which is an experiment that takes place in somebody's natural environment. And a very famous example of a field experiment uh, was the work carried out uh, by Alton Mayo. So this involved the factory management of the Hawthorne Electrical Plant in Chicago, hiring this researcher to study the links between working conditions and industrial output. So they were interested to see what kind of factors would make the workers more productive. And Mayo decided to conduct an experiment to show how changes in factors such as lighting, heating and length of breaks affected work levels. So he changed the working conditions, uh, in other words, uh, the independent variable, and then measured the resulting changes in productivity, in other words, the dependent variable. Uh, and it was found that the workers' productivity uh, increased regardless of how the researchers altered the working environment. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, adjusting the lighting levels, um, all three of the groups of employees uh, worked harder, uh, even in the group where no change had actually been made. And initially the results made no sense until Mayo realised that the employees were working harder 
not because of the changes in their environment that were part of the experiment, but because they were aware that they were being watched and because they knew that Mayo would be reporting back uh, to their boss on their work levels. So this experiment uh, is the origin of the term uh, the Hawthorne effect. Another very famous field experiment was the research carried out by Rosenthal and Jacobson uh, in America in the 1960s. So these researchers wanted to test the hypothesis that teacher expectations had important effects on pupils' academic performance. So in this field experiment, they told teachers that 20% of their children had been tested and had been shown to have high intelligence and were expected to make rapid progress in the next academic year uh, compared to other students. In reality, the students had been chosen uh, totally at random and they were no different from the other 80%. And within a year, those students whom the teachers were told were bright uh, did make very rapid progress compared to other students. And this was seen as very powerful evidence that pupil progress uh, was affected by teacher expectations and that teachers' predictions of pupil progress could actually influence the progress that they made. In other words, uh, this research uh, seemed to uh, provide powerful evidence of a self-fulfilling prophecy at work. However, this research posed ethical problems as it may well have been that teachers' high expectations of the students labelled bright were linked with low expectations of the 80% that were labelled as not being bright. And this may have had negative consequences on their progress. So it could have also have created a self-fulfilling prophecy with negative effects on student progress for the majority of students. Let's now look at some studies that you could use in the exam if you were to get a question on participant observation. And one of the practical problems of doing participant observation uh, is gaining access to the group in the first place, particularly if you're going to do covert observation. And some researchers have gone to great lengths uh, to pass as one of the group that they're observing. And an extraordinary example is the one that you can see on the screen at the moment. So this is research uh, carried out by John Howard Griffin, uh, a white man, who in 1959 used medication and sunlamp treatments to change his skin colour and pass as black. He then travelled around the deep south of the United States of America, experiencing through participant observation the impact of white racism. One of the big advantages of doing participant observation research is that the researcher may gain answers to questions which they hadn't anticipated. And this particular advantage, I think, is uh, beautifully illustrated by the work that William White did um, when he became a participant observer of an Italian street corner gang uh, in Boston. And we've got this wonderful quote here, which is worth remembering for the exam, where he says that, as I sat and listened... I learned the answers to questions that I would not have had the sense to ask if I'd been getting my information solely on an interviewing basis. However, this research also highlights uh, the way in which the presence of the researcher will change group behaviour and affect the validity of the data. And this is because the gang leader, who William White befriended, uh, a guy that in the study is referred to as Doc, admits that his behaviour uh, changed uh, as a result of the uh, observational work uh, being carried out by William White. Participant observation of criminal and deviant groups can sometimes be quite dangerous uh, for the researcher. For example, in a Glasgow gang observed by James Patrick, the pressure of living to the rules of the gang uh, ultimately grew too much for the researcher James Patrick and his unwillingness to participate in criminal activity uh, arose suspicions uh, amongst the rest of the group and in the end the pressure became too great and Patrick was forced to abandon the research and to flee the gang 
and such was his fear of reprisals that he actually delayed uh, publication of his work for a number of years, and even then he published his research under a fake name. I'm going to end this screencast just by looking briefly at a couple of examples that you could use if the exam question was about questionnaires. So one of the practical advantages of using questionnaires is because they're a relatively quick and easy research method to administer, you can use it to study very large populations. For example, the famous height report uh, into the sexual behaviour of American women uh, was sent out to 100,000 people within America. However, one of the big problems with postal questionnaires is that you often get a very, very low response rate. And this is illustrated by this famous example, because out of the 100,000 postal questionnaires that were sent out, only 3,000 were returned. So only 3% of the sample replied, and this obviously undermined the representativeness of the survey and the ability to generalise on the basis uh, of such a low response rate. Another problem with questionnaires arises when respondents give socially desirable answers rather than answers that are true and accurate. And this can obviously affect the validity of questionnaire uh, data. So for example, questionnaires have consistently shown a high level of church attendance in America uh, according to research carried out by the Gallup uh, opinion poll company. However, when you actually look at the numbers of people that actually attend church, it tends to be much, much lower uh, than the questionnaires suggest. So this strongly suggests that people are saying that they go to church uh, regularly on these questionnaires uh, because they think that's the socially desirable answer to give.